Boys, remember the big power blackout? Ontario, Quebec, 2003, August. Remember that one? Upper state New York, Connecticut, them places, right? The big power blackout, right? The big one, right? That was me. Yeah, I'm not saying I pull a dirty big switch or nothing like that, eh? but I was responsible in an indirect way. I mean, not me so much as my barbecue, eh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no ordinary barbecue, but he's what we call a prototype, eh? Oh, yeah, I've been working on him. I've been working on him, eh? Because I, I, I got what we might say a, a sort of a rocky relationship with barbecues. I mean, I've tried everything, eh? Tried everything from high batches to hot water tanks cut in half and welded up on steel pipe legs. I mean, I've tried to work. I ain't tried it all, right? I remember my first propane rig, eh? Very good year one, summertime, very good. Hey, did the job, you know, I did the job, all right. So I put the cover on her, put it away for the winter. Went to look at it next spring. Where the burner was, there was a little pile of rust in the bottom. Now, I, I, I knew the bugger was going to rust out. They said it was going to rust out. It was only a matter of time. I just did not expect it so quickly. But fortunately, I had purchased another one, a spare one. I put that one in, caught the bugger afire. Then the cover snapped with a dirty big snap. And then Larry jumps, the lava rocks caught fire. The four legs rusted out from underneath it. The bugger fell down and burned down my patio deck. Not to be defeated, boys, not to be defeated. I went looking for parts. At the parts store where I bought it, they said to me, they said, I'm sorry, sir, we're not making that model anymore. Would you consider buying a new one? I said, you're not getting me that easy. I went home and what I couldn't make up, I scrounged up. I cobbled something back together. Then I went to get the propane tank refilled. And you know what they said to me? I'm sorry, sir, that propane tank is outdated. Would you consider buying a new one? I said, you and the barbecue boys is in this together. <laughs> the whole works is a big make work project for Mississauga. <laughs> and God forbid we should ever stop buying the 900,000 barbecues that they're turning out of Mississauga every year, because if we do, the boys up there will be out of work, and they'll be down in Newfoundland looking for jobs, and we don't want that. <laughs> See, boys, I mean, I've tried it all. I've tried it all. I've been working on it. I've been working on it, right? Because what do you got? A barbecue, eh? What do you got in a barbecue? Anything to fry a pig or a cow, and preferably in the shortest period of time possible. Right? Why? Because cooking time equals beer drinking time. You take the average barbecue at my place, I think would be pretty much a standard issue. Seventeen siblings, the wives, the wives, seventeen siblings comes over. They're all standing around. Hey boy, they're all standing around. They got 34 offspring. Everybody wants their steaks done differently. Hey, everything from still living in the blood, still coming out of it, all the way to something that resembles a meteorite that entered the Earth's atmosphere at light speed. <laughs> You're catering to their individual needs and wants him. Meanwhile, they're hitting your beer. Wop, 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 wop. It was getting so the average barbecue at my place was costing several hundreds of thousands of dollars in beer alone. <laughs> I had reason why to cut down the cooking time. Cooking time equals beer drinking time. Cut down one, you cut down the other. See? It's a mathematical equation, see? That's what it is. The whole thing sort of struck me one evening when I was watching the space shuttle taking off from Cape Kennedy, see? I only had a small TV you now, I only had a small TV. But like, uh, it was easy to see, that was one old just big flame coming out of the arse of that machine. I went over to my computer and I googleized around the internet and got some statistics. And it turns out, the space shuttle is four and a half million pounds on takeoff with her boosters attached. They slings her 600 kilometers up into the sky, doing a speed of 17,321 miles an hour. No, I said to myself, like you would, I thought, if, if, like if I could concentrate all the heat energy used to put four and a half million pounds, 600 kilometers up in the sky at a speed of 17,321 miles an hour, if I could concentrate that on a cooktop, right? How fast could I cook a steak? Just a mathematical equation, you know, for one of a calculation. No, I worked it out, works out to be well done as about one ten thousandth of a second. 
and then the vision occurred to me. The vision occurred to me. A unit, for want of a better word. Down in the back garden. And you wouldn't go near the unit now, boys. You wouldn't go near the unit. You'd stand behind a concrete barrier. You know what I'm saying? Hey, and you sort of use a titanium rod. You put your stake on the end of it and you reach it out. Like, and you don't put it through the flames. You only got to show it to the flames. You know, reach it out. And you haul it back. Well done. You stick on another one. Well done. You stick I could see 17 stakes in about 34 seconds maximum. I mean, the brothers and sisters wouldn't get a chance to pop the top on a single black horse lager before I'd have a stake shoved in their face, you know. <laughs> and when you start thinking like this, you gotta buckle down, seize the opportunity, and design it, which is what I did, and I had a prototype manufactured, well, say, fabricated is a better word. Big slab of granite, nine feet long, three foot thick, with a hole in the center for a booster rocket to go up through it, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, you got a big slab of granite on the back with two big ones on the side, all for deflecting heat and concentrating it. You know? Let's just say, at 13 tons, it's not portable. <laughs> <laughs> your buddy's coming to your place. <laughs> <laughs> and the wife started getting on my case about the money I was spending, eh? Oh, yeah, the wife. Oh, yeah, getting on me about the money I was spending on this. Like I said to her, look at your old dear. That is not an expense. That is an investment. <laughs> and it's going to pay off. Because what the women know about barbecuing, anyway. <laughs> Jeez, I, I, what did the women know about the barbecue, boys? Nothing, right? Nothing. <laughs> you take my wife, for example, right? Wakes up first thing in the morning. She don't even open the curtain see what it was that was striking and building up on the side of the house going horizontal all night long. She don't even bother look and see what kind of misery is coming out of the sky in bucketfuls. She rolls over. The first thought comes out of her mind. Great day for a barbecue. <laughs> and he knows where you're going, eh? He knows where you're going. You're not going to fight it. You're going out to the barbecue. Right? And what are the women doing during the barbecue? I'll tell you what the women are doing. I'll tell you what my wife and her seven sisters is doing while I'm doing the barbecue. They're inside listening to Julio Iglesias or Yanni tapes <laughs> and getting all runny over foreign singers and making the salads. Oh, yeah, there's the big one, eh, boy? Making the salads. Breaking off a piece of lettuce, putting it under the tap and slamming around a bit, hey, and drying it off, hey, boy. We're wiping there and put it down, put it on a plate and get the old cracky, cracky, squirty, squirty juice and put it on the top of it. Down the nine she goes, another one done. That ought to qualify you for workman's compensation when the repetitive strain starts to build up, hey, boy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, what are we doing? The men, we're outside, we're doing the barbecue. We're doing the barbecue and we're doing it well. Sometimes we are overachieving, <laughs> as was the case this particular time. The one I'm talking about anyway, boys, I mean, there are some things on this planet that despite my thorough and extensive education and research, I have underestimated. <laughs> and the heat, the heat generated by liquid oxygen slash nitrogen rocket fuel <laughs> is one of those things. It's one of those things. I know the bugger was going to get hot. <laughs> I know he was going to get hot. You can't force 25,000 gallons into a sort of a, a 10 inch rocket booster under extreme pressure without generating a little bit of heat. <laughs> I just did not realize how hot it was going to get. The big unveiling came, eh? They was all there, the 17 siblings, they were standing around, you know. I hauled off the 18 by 24 foot tarpaulin cover. <laughs> there was a general jaw-dropping gasp. <gasps> and a big chorus of, well done, well done, like that, eh? By which I took to be consensus on how they wanted their steaks. Well done it is, I said, and I walked around and I opened up the fuel belt. And I went around to the front of the unit where I got a control knob on her. Control knob, pre-settings on the control knob. Cremate, crucify, and all our G's get clear of it. Yeah. And I put her up in the middle range there for a well done, you know. And then I hit the spark, right? Click! But nothing happened, eh? Click! Nothing happened, eh? Click, click, click! Nothing, nothing, nothing! Click, 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 click. And the reason nothing was happening was written right on that sparker. Made in Mississauga. <laughs> oh, you large suffering 
will Mr. Saga not leave me alone? I shut off the fuel belt and went inside to get a match. Now, I was only gone a little while. I noticed when I was going in that there was a vaporous cloud coming out over the unit and sort of, sort of permeating my garden at ground level and going beyond into the woods a bit. I never paid much attention to it, eh? <laughs> Meanwhile, when I was gone, one of the brothers, the one who was into that alternate new religion there, the Church of Greater Tax Consequences, <laughs> dubious tax breaks or something, one of those things. He was smoking a joint, eh? <laughs> Part of his religion, eh? He got to be bombed all the time, you know? <laughs> he was just finishing up, apparently, and he gives the bot a flick <laughs> in the general direction of the unit. <laughs> Let's just say he saw the light. Holy smoldering assholes, boys, I'm going to tell you. Nagasaki had nothing on it. <laughs> Hiroshima, here we come. August 13th, 2003, the temperature in Newfoundland went up nine degrees overnight. That was my barbecue. <laughs> when the heat wave struck the mainland, oh man, they put up a smog alert. And that was not smog. That's what was left of 17 steaks on me vinyl siding. <laughs> Everyone in Ontario and Quebec, they hit their air conditioners, and that's what took down the power grid, and I'm sorry for it, okay? I'm here to apologize. But I had bigger things on back in the range. No time to think. I come out the door. Lord, he jumped nines, ground zero, scorched earth. The shingles on me shit was rolled up. Hey, boy. The foliage was blown off of my raspberry bushes. I looked down over the side of the deck, and there they were, 17 of them, not a stitch of coating left on their bodies. <laughs> Nothing left but the rubber on the bottom of their sneaker boots, and that was still smoldering. <laughs> Even their frizzies was blown away. Right? <laughs> I did what I could. I offered them a beer. He never had a vocal cord lift in him to accept it. He had a scotch get him or something. <laughs> they all turned and left like he wasn't coming back. There was an x-ray of every one of them left on the side of my house. Not a minute later, the wife was out looking down over the side of the... Is the meat well done, dear? I said, well, it depends on what meat you're talking about. I said, your crowd went home. I said, but the investment just paid off. <laughs>